I didn't follow yeah, that. Uh, I mean, I heard about it. Guy going crazy. My name is Jasmine Garcia. Um, I was, in, I became involved with the Cooper Square Committee because of uh, my housing situation. Mm. Uh, I. I was doing volunteer work at the Nativity Church in 19, uh, time flies, in 1986, 85, 85, 1985, uh, I came to this neighborhood uh, and I was, I, I, I liked the, the community, I really, really loved the community, uh, I was staying with a friend uh, and with friends, I couldn't, of find an apartment for the life of me that I could afford. And I I found a, and I, oh, what am I doing? I'm telling you my, my story when I'm, I'm just introducing myself. It's okay. Right? That's, 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 that's okay. great. Okay. I can then dial the Cooper Square. Sorry if I don't make eye contact well, before, I found I'm actually, just gonna watch. I found, I found an you. application uh, that was being filled out for, for uh, uh, for, for a, 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 a building on 2nd Avenue, and there was a lottery, and I had my name and everything you could think of, so I said, well, one more, you know, I, and I put it out of my mind. But I was actually the second one picked out of that ladder, lottery, that was a second person, and I got an apartment in the first low-income co-op, in, in, in New York City, New York State. For the homeless. For the homeless. And uh, I, that's when I met the Cooper Square Committee group because I had to do intake and all that stuff. And I was amazed by the group um, and how organized they were. You know, I was appalled by it. I said, these people don't play everything. They got, they, you know, they, 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 they they were, they were, I'm still amazed by them, you know. They've done a lot of good work, and still do. Um, and that's how I hooked up with them, and I started doing volunteer work at the, in that office at the Cooper Square Committee. And a year down the road, maybe, a year down the road, I started, I became a staff person there, doing the social service uh, for, the, for the tenants of, 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 the, of our buildings. And I got involved in, in, in my building. I got involved with, with, with the future of the Cooper Square Community, which was to do this MHA thing. And that was where I got totally involved. I just had to do this. this had to, I wanted these people not to lose their housing. I, I, I know what it felt to be able to have a 99-year proprietary lease with with, with, with option to renew, for, it was amazing. But it was amazing, and for them to do it with, with a cluster of buildings and such a, a genius thing, I thought. And I wound up, I wound, I, did, I made a career out of it because it became something I had to do, because I had to help these people get that security, the anchor, to keep yourself home, and, and not have to worry about affording where, where you're gonna live, you know, or where to be displaced. That was, this is a great community. And I just love the people, you know, and, and, and the grassroots ways. <laughs> it was, the only, I didn't know any other uh, office that was operated like that one did. And then I started working with the MHA and I did, my head went like this there because I wanted to, I wanted to see this through. So we organized buildings. I, I, there was times when we would have meetings at night to tell them that we're here. The HPD is going to approve this. They would, you know, to give them information, and we were able to reach out to people. Then people started getting discouraged. So I had to like bring back the enthusiasm in the buildings, and when I was talking to tenants, I would tell them, "You got to believe this. You think that after all these years that we're not going to do this? This has got to happen, don't you see?" And I, it became like a passion. It became my passion for many years, and until I saw it through, I saw it through. When they closed the co-ops, when I did a lot of organizing work. With, the, with this project 
and it was out of all the jobs I've had, that was the most important one that I did. To be part of the closing of these people, securing their homes, not be, that they would not be displaced and they could stay here where they, where they were all their lives. That's what they know. I was here last week for a while, so I'm not going to repeat everything from the beginning. Um, uh, except to mention that, you know, in my work with the Mutual Housing Association, which well, we may call it an exercise in community planning or some other thing, you know. It really is, was, and is a major organizing campaign. Uh, it could not, you know, we had no money, uh, you know, to build anything or to renovate anything. That was the reason, as I mentioned last week, we had to make a deal with the devil and come up with the cross-subsidy approach, allowing market rate housing to be developed to subsidize the low income. Um, but our currency was not any money since we had none. It was our organizing, our ability to mobilize the community and to get them to come out because there are a number of factors to be considered, you know, in implementing the revised plan for Cooper Square. One was um, when we got around to the revised plan, this neighborhood changed dramatically from being a really poor neighborhood with uh, you know, rundown buildings and derelict buildings and of course terrible, you know, conditions into a very gentrified neighborhood, which made it extremely attractive, although it always has been attractive, to real estate speculators. And uh, we had a, the, the fight of our lives in our hands. We had to fight a local council member, which had remained nameless, okay, who had made a deal <laughs> with uh, speculators, promising that he would deliver one or more of the buildings slated for the MHA uh, for private profit. Um, we had to convince people, as Jasmine mentioned, that this proposal was real, not a pipe dream. And I was really appreciative during that period, extending to the present time, to have Jasmine as my right-hand person, because she had credibility the way other people could not muster, because she had lived through the process. She had been herself homeless, and she had seen the project come to fruition. And many of the lessons that we first learned from creating a Q-building co-op we had uh, adopted it to the Mutual Housing Association, of course, extending it to many buildings. But it was very difficult times. Uh, it was times during the 80s when it looked hopeless. In the last week, we talked about spin-off organizations that Cooper Square helped to create. One organization that I think we neglected to mention was the Lower East Side uh, Drug-Free Zone Coalition that Chris and I worked on, okay? And that was a time when uh, people despaired and of course they blamed the homeless for everything that was wrong with the neighborhood. Um, the homeless were drug dealers and they should all be kicked out and the shelter should be closed, okay? And we created an alternative position to that. And that position was drug dealers, no, homeless people, yes. And we made our buildings available to homeless families. And a lot of them came into our building during the 80s. Um, there was a an attempt to register homeless people to vote. And the, the local right-wing forces that were also connected with a group called BASTA tried to put a stop to it. They got a petition signed by a lot of people on 3rd Street opposing the homeless people's rights to register to vote. So we had to go along with the petition because they got a lot of our tenants to sign on to it, but we had it instead on the Bowery, okay? And it was very successful, and sure Chris can talk about that. I'm just going to stop you there and yeah. see what we can get around. Sure. And maybe we'll keep our intros to like three minutes. Because we do want to hear like something okay. interesting. But we'll get, maybe hold back on telling too much about the plans because we're going to get to them together. Okay. <laughs> but thank you, Doc. Sure. Okay. Uh, so I'm Brandon Kilbasa and I'm the lead organizer at Cooper Square, uh, at the Cooper Square Committee right now. Um, so I'm a staffer. Um, and have been on board since February 2007. And uh, uh, well, I'm paid staff. I <laughs> got involved because I really care about this stuff, of course. Um, I had moved to New York in 2005, 2004, um, and had moved here from, I'm originally from Detroit, Michigan, but had moved here from Maine, where I had done an AmeriCorps VISTA uh, internship and was a housing advocate in Midcoast, Maine. And, um, and got involved in 
community and working with homeless and working within my own community in Detroit a bit, but uh, decided to do the AmeriCorps VISTA program to kind of make more of a commitment to that and also uh, make more of a shift in what I was going to do for a career. Um, so after doing that, I moved to New York um, to go to school, took a couple of jobs that were unrelated to this field and really quickly became uh, disenfranchised and disheartened by the work and said I got to get back into doing what I broke away from my old line of work to do. Um, found my way to Cooper Square in yeah the winter of 2004, 2007 rather, um, was hired on as a part-time housing counselor and um, was within that year brought up to full-time status and um, asked to be more of the organizer than counselor on staff, um, which Steve Herrick, the director at that point, didn't have at all. Um, he had a Christian Valerio who was doing a lot of entitlement work and doing a lot of uh, housing counseling but not any organizing. Steve was doing his best to be involved with different coalitions where he could, but it was kind of top down from the professional kind of umbrella of organizations that Cooper Square has been involved with. Um, AHD, Tenants and Neighbors, all these groups fighting for advocacy and reform of policy issues around housing, but he didn't have the staff to do any kind of grassroots tenants association, tenant organizing at that point, so I became the go-to guy on staff, um, and I think by 2000, end of 2004, I, or 2007, I was uh, full-time doing more organizing than counseling, and I've since kind of remained in that role at Cooper Square. Thank you. Yeah. So we're just um, introducing how we became involved in Cooper Square Committee, and if it was if it was partly because of your housing situation, also we'd love to hear that. Um, I'm Joshua. We haven't had the chance to meet. Yes. Yeah, Chino, nice to meet Chino, thank you for coming. Um, stuck on a thread, so I didn't get all the way. Um, but we're trying to add or share stories that are personal but also part of the collective history of the Cooper Square Committee and the work in this neighborhood. I've heard mentions about you, so I can't wait to hear. Yeah, I, um, at the, I, I got, I, 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 I find out about Cooper Square when I was around 19 years old. Um, I met Nesto uh, Martinez in relationship to the Sewell Park situation. And, and uh, he asked me if I could participate with that. And at that time, you know, uh, I, I, I was involved with a group called the Rio Grace Society, which now is called Chajas. And, and, uh, and they needed more youth leaders in, in the uh, movement to Shrasua Park. So I started participating, and then I had the honor to introduce me to Francis Gordon. And, at the, and basically, since then, I, and of course, if you meet Francis Gordon, Cooper Square <laughs> comes with it as a package, <laughs> you know? So, so at the, um, and Nesta was the head of, uh, I think, the housing coalition at that time. So anyway, so at the, um, since then, we all started supporting each other in all kinds of situations. Groups help the other groups in any way we can. And, you know, besides political stuff, we also supported each other uh, with cultural or, 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 or different uh, activities, social activities, etc., etc. Um, and basically, um, you know, the, I became a good friend of Cooper Square. And throughout the years, uh, I got chosen to be in several committees, you know. Uh, and it's been an honor working with the group. Uh, and and uh, Cooper Square Symbolic is one of the most important progressive neighborhood organizations. I think now in the whole Lower East Side, there's only two of them, Goals mm -hmm. and Cooper Square. You know, they are the two major organizations that are dealing with major housing advocacy in the law side. Uh, Most of the other groups, they all closed down for whatever reason. So um, at the, I'm very proud that I've been participating, and I still am 
you know, if I ever need it, you know, and, 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 and I've been very close to a personal friend of a lot of the staff within Puppet Square. Both, you know, both are part of Puppet Square. <laughs> Mutual housing and the community, you know. Thank you so much, Chino. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so my name is Lynn Lewis. I um, am a former Cooper Square. I was a tenant uh, when I lived here from 80 to 85. The city, HPD, still on the buildings and uh, Cooper Square had just initiated the process of looking at uh, whether to become an MHA. Um, I came here, I, I first came on this block because I made friends with Alex Harsley who is a photographer on this block and we became friends. He's the first friend I made in New York City. Um, and I got really excited about Cooper Square because I myself had, you know, I'm from a rural area. Uh, my family has lost farms and uh, long story there. And so I've always been really interested in the idea of who controls the land that they live on and that they work on. And when I lived here, there happened to be you know, 900 or more or less men's shelter beds around the corner. And you would have to, it was like an obstacle course in the morning walking down the street. There were so many homeless folks. And um, fast forward, you know, I'm the director of Picture the Homeless. Uh, you know, when I lived here, we were using crowbars to open empty apartments and move homeless families in them. Um, you know, my rent was $75 a month. I was a student. I was on welfare. I would never have survived if I didn't have cheap rent. And there's no way to disconnect having cheap rent and affordable housing um, and having people fight for that. Um, it doesn't happen without the organizing. So um, I've been very close friends with many of the organizers at Cooper Square because at that time, it wasn't just a job, you know. I mean, I probably spent six weeks on Valerio's couch um, <laughs> having a, my own personal struggles and people fed each other, people came to each other's houses. We had to move, um, when we had no heat and hot water for six weeks one winter, I think it was 80, 81, the winter my daughter was born, we were moving older people into apartments that, of buildings that had heat. Um, and we were ha our meetings were about, you know, go check on the elderly people in, the, in this building to see if they have heat. and. Let's get extra, extra blankets. And that's how we survived the whole time. Um, you know, and a lot of us are still friends today. And this is one of probably one of the only blocks in Manhattan that you could walk down the street and still see people that you were friends with 35 years ago. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I, just before I say how I got involved in this, I got to say, we're, we're going to be talking about, or you talked last week about spinoffs of Cooper Square. I just want to make the point that it's not just the spin-offs, it's the way Cooper Square has attracted people like Chino and who are involved with organizations that didn't spin off of Cooper Square, but are organizations that have made and are making a huge amount of difference in the social and cultural life of the city. Um, so it's, it's not just what did Cooper Square start, um, but who did Cooper Square attract? And we wouldn't have had an ally like Chino if we hadn't been doing the kind of stuff we were doing. Um, get old for women. I myself, I shouldn't even be here. In 1978, I lost my apartment on um, Avenue C and 9th Street, well, I didn't actually lose the apartment. I could see that I was going to lose the apartment because the landlord had sold the building. He was a great landlord, but he sold the building to a, a, an SOB. Um, and so I could tell that the rents were going to go up sky high. I wouldn't be able to afford them. And a, a friend of mine lived in an apartment at 77 East 4th Street, a tiny back room with a tub in the kitchen, a closet for a toilet, um, just barely out of the stage of toilet in the hall, and holes in the floor you could see down to the apartment below. Uh, but it looked great to me because the rent was just about $100, um, and I could afford that. 
but it was illegal. He was an illegal subletter, and he was going to sublet to me because he was moving to California, so I was doubly illegal. So I hid. I did not get involved with Cooper Square because I was afraid if they found out who I was and that I was really doubly illegal, I'd be out of my ass. Um, and what changed that for me was in 1984, I went to Nicaragua and spent four months taking part in the revolution down there and learning about revolution and what revolution really is. It turned out to be entirely different from the romantic idea that I had had up until then. Um, and one of the things I did while I was down there, because uh, I was working uh, down there, and I met a lot of people, and I would ask people, you know, what can I do to help the Nicaraguan Revolution when I go back to New York? Because clearly I wasn't going to move to Nicaragua forever. And the answer was almost invariably, where do you live? I said, well, I live on 4th Street in New York. And they said, well, go back there and make one. <laughs> So I came back here and found that one was already in progress. I didn't have to start one. Um, and so I got involved with it. And once you get involved with Cooper Square, I mean, forget it. The rest of your life is, is uh, laid out for you. Uh, and, um, so I, I eventually ended up getting legal. Cooper Square helped me to get legalized with HPD, uh, helped me to get certain aspects of the apartment uh, improved slightly. Um, and then um, I got involved, uh, ever deeper involved. I got on the steering qu committee of Cooper Square. I got uh, involved with all the retreats we had, planning for the MHA and so forth. And these meetings were often endless and sometimes boring, but always productive, ultimately. And uh, it took a long, long time, but we did it. And uh, the the and that, and we reached a stage where we actually had done this. And oh, one other thing I wanted to say about the about the the way we were involved with it. I noticed as soon as we had said the business about having a 99-year proprietary lease, owning in other words, owning our own apartments, the thought crept into my mind. Oh man. An apartment in the East Village, I could sell that for half a million dollars and be a rich man. And I thought, if I'm thinking that way, everybody's thinking that way, and we had better do something to make sure that doesn't happen, because the whole idea of this is to keep these apartments low income forever, or at least 200 years, which is forever so far as I'm concerned. Um, and so then that's when we started getting involved with the Community Land Trust and the, and the legal structure that Marty Berger set up for us, which was brilliant. Uh, as far as we can tell, we have, there's no way that a speculator can come in and take over these buildings now. Um, and that was really important. So. Great, thank you so much. Okay. Um, <clears throat> my name is Brian Rose and I'm a photographer. Uh, I came here in 1977 um, to study at Cooper Union. Originally I was at the University of Virginia uh, where I was studying uh, urban planning and architecture, but I uh, had changed my uh, focus to being an artist, so I had come up to Cooper. I needed a place to live. I arrived in the uh, summer of 77. Um, found an apartment listed in the Village Voice for $50 a month, <laughs> which was unbelievably low even then, in 1977. And I was very suspicious of it because of that. Um, it turned out that um, it was a sublet. Uh, the tenant um, took me across the street to the HPD office, and we signed some papers and made it official. So it was a, a legal sublet. He left, uh, he was a professor, he moved to New Orleans, and <clears throat> suddenly there I was, um, and didn't know whether I'd be able to stay in this apartment or not. I was a, a, at first afraid to go to Cooper Square <laughs> Committee, because I was, <laughs> I realized that my status was sort of um, 
you know, quasi-legal at that point. Um, but, it, but at some point I did. I went to uh, the office uh, downstairs and introduced myself and uh, told them what my situation was, my dilemma was, and um, uh, that I had no money and that I, you know, I was going to school here, but it's a, it used to be a tuition-free school and uh, you didn't have to have a lot of money to go there. Um, and uh, the, they told me that uh, they would help me uh, secure the apartment for myself, and so I was able to do that. Um, and then after that, once I had um, become uh, familiar with Cooper Square, I started to get involved. And at some point, I joined the uh, steering committee. And that's that's my the beginning of my story. Great. I got on the steering committee, and then, uh, as uh, Chris was saying, I got totally sucked in. And <laughs> <laughs> that's it. That's it. That great sucking noise. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess you're one of the document documentators of a lot of those that, those activities in that era. Because on, on the internet, when you look up some of the work that's done here, a lot of the images are yours. Mm -hmm. So you've continued to play a role as a photographer. Well, I. I Two years ago, I published a book called Time and Space on the Lower East Side, which is a, a sort of uh, comparison of uh, 1980 and recent pictures. Uh, not exact before-afters, but a kind of uh, look at the neighborhood over you know, a 20 or 30 year period of time. Uh, so that, um, you know, I, for me, that was coming back to my roots when I first came here and did pictures in 1980. So I've, you know, although I'm not involved with the um, Cooper Square Committee or MHA now, I still have a ongoing interest in the Lower East Side. Hi, my name is Renee Schoenbeek. I'm a, an urban planner originally from uh, Amsterdam and I got connected to Cooper Square in 1987 and it turned out to be a life-changing uh, uh, encounter. Uh, it was uh, a field trip um, that was part of my studies. I was studying urban geography in Amsterdam at the time. There were about 20 of us. We ended up uh, at the Cooper Square Committee's office. Friend Golden talked to us, students, and you know, told us a lot of things, but one thing that stuck with me is that she said, we need help. We need help from people like you who go to school to become planners and uh, can help us uh, come up with these uh, alternative plans and talk to the city about what it is that we wanted. And it was the first time ever that somebody told me that they needed me. And um, I have to say I wasn't that uh, serious a student until then because I decided that I wanted to come back to New York City, work with Cooper Square Committee and help them. So um, I came back in December of 1989 um, and um, worked with the Cooper Square Committee for uh, six months in their office. And at the same time, uh, we did, I was here with a fellow student. We did a project. Uh, we studied the uh, concept of mutual housing associations. And actually, we produced a, a number of documents that, uh, that Brian here still has that sort of laid out the framework for mutual housing and association and also I'm very proud of this, uh, this, this, this chart that sort of is the first sort of concept of the uh, community land trust because we were thinking about the way things were organized in the Netherlands where uh, there is a separation of uh, ownership of land and uh, buildings and it seemed to be a concept that could work here. Um, why did it turn into a life-changing uh, encounter is, uh, as Brian said, he was at the Cooper Square Steering Committee at the time, uh, the same time that we were working in the office. That's how we met. Um, and fast forward, years later, we got married. Mm -hmm. Fast forward, we have a son. We lived in Amsterdam at the time. And uh, in um, uh, uh, 2007, we decided to move uh, to New York as a family. So now we're here. And um, I still uh, feel closely connected to uh, Cooper Square and their cause. Um, I work in a different neighborhood now. 
um, but I, I, uh, I truly believe in, in what the group has done by ways of organizing the community grassroots bottom up, uh, stand up against uh, the city policies at the time, and be very uh, smart about using not only the sort of power of the community organizing, but also drawing in young people uh, and get them uh, on their case. And, and I, I'm, you know, the story you told, uh, saying you know, if part of your studies got interested, and here you are. Uh, I think it's brilliant the way they've always been able to uh, bring in people from all over the place, young people who. Um, uh, worked with them on, on uh, you know, thinking through the whole city, the model and getting it done. So. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> um, my name is Mary Nell Hawk. My first name is Mary Nell. My last name's Hawk. And I um, moved to a Cooper Square apartment on East Third Street between Bowery and Second Avenue, circa 1976. And um, first learned about the food co-op. So I knew Fran from the food co-op. And um, actually, I lived at 59 East 3rd Street. I soon, because of my other friendship with Sharon Matlin, um, found out about Cooper Square. And to save like $150 a month, which was considerable to me at that time, because I was in the arts, I moved to Cooper Square. My parents were in shock. My brother was in shock because the Bowery across the street was in shelter <laughs> and all of that. But even um, in those days, there was an amazing sense of community. The super of the building next door was able to secure, uh, Gail was able to secure an unused apartment. We all had bike rooms so we could share, bicy by share bicycle storage. Um, and I was involved in the arts, so eventually, fast forward, well, 1976, 77, there was something on the drawing boards that was really special about um, what there was called Site One, which was Stanton and Christie, 100 and, um, I don't know, 80 or 30 apartments that were going up, and, um, and it was really hard to get, and in this uh, economic, climate that we have now, it's almost impossible to understand the fact that developer was stalling for years and years because interest rates were too high. So everything was like on the approved by everybody for the, all this housing and it was years before it was finally built because of interest rates. So, you know, I don't know what kind of lesson is there, but it was an interesting thing and we were all sort of waiting and, and moving and and you know, trying to figure out how to make that work and also how to incorporate artworks into the housing. So that was the thing that was very interesting to me. And um, I was on a subcommittee with Fran and Walter and other people, and Paul, and, and we did get that, but it looked like they would never get installed because the housing would never get built. Well, 1985, the housing opened. Um, the artworks were basically in place. Um, some gorgeous work um, that's still there. And um, I have to be very honest, from day one, it was and is a problematic building. And in my opinion, it was because of the, the deficiencies in the Section 8 program as it existed now and as it still existed. The owners of the building were getting market rent, but they were giving slum service and still are. Um, I have moved out. I was involved in a different Cooper Square um, project and uh, took advantage of that. But I've stayed a little bit close to Debbie, Alicia, and Cheryl, who are mm -hmm. involved still to this day mm -hmm. on the Tenants Association there. They're having a terrible time. Um, and they've gotten, you know, they've gotten some, um, they've gotten some funding to improve the circumstances down there. But as has happened in the past with Super Square, Super Square, that was a good one. <laughs> What's happened in the past is that um, when people work so hard to get money and then when the funds come in, all of a sudden people come out of the woodwork who are, ch are challenging and who are 
you know, hostile towards the people that are trying to do the right thing, you know, et cetera. So, you know, I guess I'm here to tell my story in a nutshell, but also to implore everybody who's here to really get on the bandwagon to continue to figure that out because there's so many apartments there and people there are scared also to come forward and that's a big problem because a lot of people over earn too much so it puts people into the underground economy and um, that creates a whole lot of problems so anyway um, that's my story that's my hope um, I could talk a little bit more about you know getting that building going but that was important okay Thank you so much Mary. I read about you so we're just introducing ourselves how we got involved in was as a housing we're identifying that and then we're going to jump into a good conversation in a second about the creation of the chain. Yeah, I'm sorry I'm going to miss the conversation at least until you get back. But. So we have an intro and then Val's going to jump in. Sure. Um, well, my name is, is Howard Gibbs Hobgood. Um, I'm coming primarily from um, a resident's perspective. I've been involved somewhat over the years um, with the organization, um, but have lived in the buildings for 27 years. My father lived there 27 years before that. Um, and it's where both of our children were born, literally in our apartment. Um, so it's home, it's home more than than anything, and um, I guess I guess the thing that is interesting for me whenever people try to organize around something is the friction. Um, I think any endeavor that involves people getting together to push something through um, is going to involve drama, and and for anybody w willing and, and attempting to do that. Uh, Accept it, <laughs> really accept it. Um, accept the fact that people, every individual comes with their own drama and there's always contention. I, I can't think of a meeting that I've been to, whether in my building or in JASA or in uh, any aspect of Cooper Square or MHA, where there weren't outspoken voices for and against. And I think to push things through, people have to sort of accept that as part of the, the building process. and and accept that as really part of the community process because when it really comes down to it where we live is really our community. I'm always hoping for more in terms of engagement where um, it's hard to make New York City feel like a community. Um, but having rent that's affordable and, and having a community of these buildings um, around where we live is, is a phenomenal baseline for, for growing a stronger and a warmer community and accepting all the disappointments and the struggles and the drama that's inherent in that. Thank you. Thank you. So Val, I'm wondering if in a few seconds before you mm -hmm. have to take off, if you could start us off on the moment where you guys, something changes politically that allows this project to move forward in a new direction. Well, it amazes me sometimes that the most, um, the most innovative ideas after they are implemented make people say, what's innovative about it? It's common sense, you know? <laughs> uh, when Walter Thabit proposed his plan, one of his basic principles was that uh, urban renewal tenants should be the beneficiaries and not the victims of urban renewal. And applying that to the most current project of Cooper Square Community Mutual Housing Association. You know, we looked at different housing plans when we brought the community together. We had workshops, we had all kinds of activities to educate our community about different options. Uh, we came up with the notion that, you know, individual co-ops as existed under the TILT program or under community management or even homesteading, in the long run would have a difficult time surviving because if they were low-income people, they couldn't afford to pay for a new boiler or a new roof that you would need at some time, even if the building had been renovated. So we came up with this very innovative idea of... Hold on a second. 
we came up with this very innovative idea of what if you bring a whole lot of buildings together and we create an economy of scale? And basically that's what the MHA was about. We brought 21 buildings together uh, with one board for all the 21 buildings. Uh, we were able to purchase fuel and supplies, insurance at a discounted rate. We had a reserve fund that was for all the buildings. We were able to pool the commercial income to benefit all the tenants, not just tenants in particular buildings. Mm -hmm. And that was the key to permanent affordability. That is so commonsensical. What is so innovative about it? But at this point, the Mutual Housing Association model and the other structure, the community land trust that owns the land underneath the buildings, has been looked upon as a model for the entire city of New York. And I'm very pleased that I was involved in making it happen along with all the people here and many, many others. Mm. And I have a lot more to say, but I'm going to run. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about That's that. That's a really uh, succinct uh, summary of what it's about. So, I, you know, um, I mean, and Val, of course, more than anybody is in a position to make that kind of a statement. But, that I'm not, I'm not going to take away somebody else's uh, moment here, but I just, that, that was really well uh, laid out, I think. So now, since we've all introduced that, we can just talk freely between each other, not necessarily interrupt each other, but step in and add to the story, or add different sides as we go. The one thing I would add to what Val just said is that, um, it, it, besides the, the difficulty of keeping a till building, in uh, as low income, uh, just because of the, the difficulty of paying for a new boiler and things like that. There's also the, the basic principle of, if you're in a till building, you own your apartment and you can sell it. And you can sell it as a, at, as a, at market rates, and so you get to benefit from it once, and then nobody else ever gets to benefit from it. And that, of course, is what Antonio Pagan, who shall not remain nameless, because that son of a bitch nearly, nearly beat us. Um, but uh, that's what he wanted. Um, he wanted the ability to, to have his apartment and sell it and become wealthy. And, uh, you know, in a, in a way, that's the American dream. That's what everybody wants and all that stuff. And that's what we are standing against it, in a it, larger it wouldn't, sense. Had, had the buildings all been um, split up uh, rather than coming under a larger umbrella, um, maybe a couple of buildings would have survived maybe, and, and yeah. that might have happened. But I think most of our tenants were so low income, had so few resources, that they were bound to fail yeah. uh, if they had gone into this till or one of the other yeah. uh, programs. And I think every, you know, the majority of people understood that and yeah. that, that was, you know, became really obvious to us that we had to hold together the you know, the buildings. Otherwise, they would just, one by one, they would fail in some way. Well, you, you know, one of the most important things, I, I think, uh, as, as an organizer, is that a lot of us started doing things, <coughs> new projects and new ideas, where there wasn't a presence someplace else where we could study so other groups like Cooper Square, Adopt the Building, Charters, all the we came up with ideas that nobody ever did before. You know what I mean? Or, um, and and we kept on trying and one of the biggest uh, problems that we had is how we got we could keep housing for low income people. It doesn't mean that we want those low-income people to stay low-income forever because a lot of them progressed and they became very successful people once they finished school or once the uh, brothers and sisters started going uh, to universities. So some of them did very well. But at that time, we were working with the core of the family, which it was poor and working class. And then what happens with those people in the future? Then we started seeing as the future kept on coming, people setting up apartments that we helped get for $250. <laughs> said they were setting it for a tremendous amount of money, which is nothing wrong with that, but none of us wanted that at that time. And we had to figure out ways. One of the things that I'm very 
proud that I listened to. It was the one time in a meeting at that building, we were going organizing the housing authority tenants to try to get the city to turn over the buildings to the tenant and turn them into courts. You know, you know, and and um, one time Frances came to a meeting, Frances Gordon, and she and, and she she said, "Look, I think we should concentrate on rentals and not on co-ops." Now at that time, I, I was with Adapt Adapter Building in Charras. We 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 did the first what equity building to make into a co-op, which is still the original tenants. A lot of them are still in that building, and it's still controlled by the original tenants. What so, address is that? Uh, 90, uh, 519 East 11th Street, and and um, that's the building that had the solar energy and the windmill, you know. So and 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 it's still owned by by them. So anyway, so so in the case. In the case of that, um, one of the things that Francis mentioned is if we concentrate on rentals, you know, we really could help people. The problem is that the, uh, I, we noticed that the low-income people that we help get their apartment part ownership to through uh, the city, they started selling the apartments immediately. People went to them and said, here's 50,000. Those people never saw $50,000 in their hands. You know, you know, the most they have seen is the salary, you know, or whatever social services we give them. And all of a sudden, they all started selling and moving to Puerto Rico, or, <laughs> and, and then they come back a year later broke, looking for an apartment. <laughs> you know, and this happened a lot, you know, you know. And the thing is that, that um, what you call the, a lot of the apartments that we got for low-income people, they sold them, you know, you know, very cheap at that time, and you know, I regret to say, um, what you call um, we saw, you know, we felt that we must fail that this is happening. So I think uh, we kept on experimenting with things, and when the mutual housing idea came through, I thought that was really a very good solu solution for that problem that we was facing, you know? And I'm very proud that I think it's a good system and I think we should encourage other groups. See, because the problem also is that people who come from all over the world to our neighborhood and ask groups like Adopt the Building, Cooper Square, how could I do this at home? You know what I mean? And at some point you felt, you know, I don't think we're that crazy about this idea because we see people selling apartments <laughs> faster than they could think, you know. And it's sad, a lot of them spend that money fast because they didn't know how to manage it. And then they came back looking for apartments again, you know. And by that time, it was almost impossible. So we have to be careful. Well, Francis in that meeting, I think, made it clear if we would succeed, which I think we could have if we really organized it, take control of housing authority, which is rental now, and I hope it stays like that. You know, um, I strongly believe, you know, the housing authority down by the FDR Drive would have become all co-ops now, upper class co-op, because a lot of the poor people, we saw those apartments fast. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so I'm glad that we stopped that movement of trying to turn housing authority into co-ops. You know, you know, and those are things that we have to analyze. But all that stuff came by discussions, by organizing and deciding, you know, somebody is right. In this case, people like Francis, you know, giving us that advice, you know, I, I think, um, you know, the housing authority is still heavily rental and it's mixed income to this day, you know? And I hope it stays like that. Mm -hmm. um, I'm gonna pull us back to the 70s uh, and early 80s and talk about what happened that led up to the MHA actually being formed. Um, when I got involved in Cooper Square, um, the operating 
basis for what we were going to do was the early action plan, alternate plan uh, for the Cooper Square Urban Renewal Area. And this is a document that was basically done by uh, Walter Thabit, who was a, uh, a planner who dedicated his life to um, uh, activist, uh, he was an activist planner. Um, and um, his, his plan um, was, um, uh, you know, guaranteed that the tenants that were in place would stay. The problem was, as we got further into the 70s and into the 80s, was that the city was no longer doing large projects, the kind of thing that you were talking about with the, the housing authority uh, does now. And uh, there appeared to me no way that the that this plan, the alternate plan, would would be implemented. There was no, there were no city programs, no federal programs that were that would make this work. So some of us um, started talking about um, putting an emphasis on preserving the tenement buildings because this plan originally had called for them to be demolished even though the tenants would, would have been guaranteed a place to live, it still called for demolishing. And the whole way of thinking about neighborhoods had changed. Um, you know, Jane Jacobs had written her groundbreaking book about um, the importance of community and neighborhoods. And um, the idea of doing these big urban renewal projects, really that time period had passed. So we started talking about how to preserve the, the, the buildings that existed. Um, and yes, there were programs like Till and, uh, and um, uh, you know, that were aimed at individual buildings, but we didn't see that that could work for us, especially with tenants so low income. We also didn't know what we were going, were going to do with the vacant sites down on, on Houston Street, which were part of the Cooper Square plan. So we came up with a, a, another plan, which um, was introduced in 1986. This is the, the original document here. Um, I worked on it with um, another uh, Dutch, uh, other Dutch uh, uh, consultants uh, that arrived before Rene did, Ad Reichers and Yvonne van der Steen. And Brian Sullivan was our uh, planner from Pratt Institute. And what we proposed was that um, we would allow for the development of those sites on Houston Street, um, provided that the city would, would come up with the money to renovate all the buildings on 3rd and 4th Street and a few others. And that there would be a guarantee of at least 20% uh, low income units in the new buildings. So. It was a very difficult step for us to take as a group, uh, for the Cooper Square Committee to take, because it, it involved some pretty serious compromises, developing those sites in particular, because we knew that would be market rate housing. Um, but it, it was the, politically, it was something that we thought we could actually do. Remember, in the late 70s, it's, it's Ed Koch. Uh, a lot of animosity between the Cooper Square Committee and the Koch administration. Some of it had gone back to personal animosity between Francis Golden and Ed Koch. And anyway, you know, then we had a, a window of opportunity with um, David Dinkins. Yes. And we were able to get the plan um, approved by the city. But then he only lasted four years and we were into uh, Rudolf Giuliani. And as much as, you know, I'm never going to say anything else positive about Giuliani, uh, many of his um, HPD um, uh, deputy commissioners were people that we could work with. And we continued to negotiate with them during those years and eventually um, ironed out this agreement, which, which then got implemented. So the, the, what happened was this organization, which had been wedded to an original plan, created a new plan, made a lot of compromises that were difficult to accept and took a tremendous amount of, uh, 
you know, within the, it wasn't just Try. selling it, it wasn't just selling it to the outside <laughs> community, it was getting our own community to meetings. accept it. Meetings. Yeah, meetings. Long drama. Meetings. Yeah. <laughs> drama. Yeah. Yeah. Strong yeah. opinions. You, you mentioned the compromises. What were the main, the main one or two? It's, well, it's the, called the cross subsidy. Yeah. So you would allow a market rate in order to pay for the uh, affordable housing. Yes, that was the 20%. Yeah, yeah so this you give was up on 100% affordable. This is was happening at the same time also that the, on the Lower East Side in general, you had this discussion about cross-subsidy, which I, I wasn't, I didn't like. I, I wasn't in favor of it because I felt it was too much of a, kind of a blanket thing. Whereas I felt like what we were doing was like very specific about a you know, very special situation and a limited number of buildings and people. So, yeah, it's okay, finish. Um, I think you bore. Yeah, I think I'm basically finished with that. But I think that that's the, the a lot of people who come here to the, you know, the neighborhood now, they see the buildings down there on Houston Street with Whole Foods and everything, and they're, they're thinking, oh, this was so terrible that this happened. Yeah. Um, but they don't know that it was actually the key to, um, ensuring the permanent affordability of 25 buildings worth of low-income people. Low-income and, and beautifully renovated, I must say. Mm -hmm. From the, the very first buildings were, the renovations were not so great, and so we formed a residence committee, a tenants committee, to oversee the renovations, and we became quite expert on how to do this. It was particularly one guy, Bobby Charles, who could look at a floor from this distance and say, that's not level over there. And you'd take a four foot level and yeah, it was off by an eighth of an inch. And, and so we, we went around to the buildings and watched the, re the, the renovations and made sure that the renovations happened, that shortcuts weren't taken. And I remember one night Sharon Goldstein and I were walking down the block and we heard something happening in, uh, it must have been uh, 69 or 71 or 73, one of those buildings. And the front door was open. It was pitch dark in there. We heard hammers and so forth. We went in and found five immigrant workers tearing apart the staircase in the dark with a flashlight. What? And we, we, uh, asked them to stop, and uh, we got in touch with the with the uh, with the contractor, and 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 with Cooper Square Committee, and we had a meeting. And you cannot do this. You cannot exploit these workers this way, and made sure that that kind of practice didn't continue. But that took daily vigilance on our part, and I'd forgotten that. But it was like, yeah, we did a lot of that kind of stuff. Um, you know, um, in the early 80s, when Koch became mayor, you know, the Cooper Square Committee got funding from the city to do tenant organizing, like a lot of other tenant organizing groups did. Mm -hmm. And overnight, Koch uh, took away the funding from Cooper Square. Mm -hmm. And all the staff that worked in the office um, went on unemployment um, and looked for other jobs. And um, many of them had to leave because they had to take another job. Not all of them. Uh, lived at Cooper Square, and uh, Valerio stayed on, um, and the tenants that lived here had to staff the office, mm -hmm. and Francis was walking around, going in every building, and not banging on doors. Um, I had just had a baby, and she's, um, you know, saying to me, and like you, you say to organizers, and organizers say to leaders and potential leaders, I need you to do this. <laughs> I don't know how to do that. Well, you need to do it, um, and so I'll show you how to do it. And it's this combination of, you know, hugging you with one arm and, you know, pushing you. Push. <laughs> and, um, and, and, and the reason that works is because the alternative is so scary that yeah, you yeah. do those, the things that you're least scared of and that might offer some hope. But the... To imagine going through this, you know, collective educational process that's fraught with drama in the midst of not having any staff, 
for several years, paid staff in the office. Elba was a bookkeeper. I don't even know if she got paid. Um, and she had another she job at Children's Liberation. She did. So she did oh, yeah. that on the oh, side. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Valerio being on unemployment. And then tenants who really didn't quite know all what we were doing, um, staffing an office. And saying to folks, okay, we need to imagine something that doesn't exist or that they do in the Netherlands, right. you know, and let's figure out how to do this here while at the same time NYU was trying to buy the buildings. Right. Um, HPD wasn't allowing the uh, Cooper Square to rent the, the vacant apartments because if they were less than 50% um, occupied, then they could clear out the rest of the building. So we were under siege at that time. And some of the things that we did, you know, Cooper Square has always had this block party every year. We had a site action committee. I was, uh, another thing I never did, I was elected to the site action committee. I didn't know what that meant. Um, and then we approached Cooper Square and said, we want to start having potluck dinners with tenants in the office on Sunday. And it was, look, you know, like enough already, you know, we're already working seven days a week. and. Because the Little Brothers, uh, which was a group of oh, radical Catholic uh, yeah. priests and brothers, they we were able to convince the the, the staff um, and the rest of the steering committee that we needed to to bring people into this organizing process. People had to feel like the office belonged to them, and so we started having potluck dinners once a month in the office and. Um, for several years going through this whole, not just talking about, you know, an MHA or talking about a land trust, but, you know, dancing together in the social club that's, you know, that Carlos Perez had for many years and having parties um, in each other's apartments, you know, and really knowing each other and a lot of people knowing each other really well, um, makes the me all the meetings, the formal meetings, where you talk about something that you never heard of before, and it's the meetings are translated, and if you've just been they take five like hours. Right. <laughs> so I, I, it's the community building informally that happens along with the organizing that makes the organizing possible, and then the organizing in conjunction with basically kind of a democratic form of community planning. All those things intersect. And you might maybe could not remove one from the other to really achieve from the early 80s to 90. In those 10 years, the, it was a huge shift in what was happening here in Cooper Square. And that's really not a long time, if you really think about it. No, I think I, I, I want to, it's exactly what I wanted to say, that I think that the really unique situation here is where you both have the grassroots bottom up and, and sort of working with neighbors and very smart people coming up with very smart answers or ways to convince the city to let you do something that they would never think of. And there's always the risk that then the planners take over, but that never happened here because, like you said, it still had to be a process where everybody was involved and everybody came to the same conclusions. Because it, uh, now in my professional life, I see it a lot, that the professionals figure it out, and then they go to the community and tell them, this is what you should be doing. And that never worked here that way, and I think ultimately it is, it's uh, absolute, you know, a critical part of the success of the organization and getting there, and also maintaining it for so long. Because let's face it, it was like, we're not talking about a 60 year process if you go all the way back from when it started. And I was only part of you know, a tiny short period of that very long stretch. But so many pe people stuck with it for so long. And that can only happen, I think, if people really truly feel involved and, and listened to. Mm -hmm. Toward the end, toward the, toward the end of our struggle, well, our well, struggle, but toward the end of the struggle of getting the closing, that was very scary because we were this close to closing and now the tenants didn't believe it anymore because it took too long. And so we had to have meeting after meeting after meeting after meeting and to tell them, please understand that this is going to happen. You don't think that after all this work, we're going to you know, not do this. Right. You, gotta, you, you have to sign on to the point where Val 
with a brilliant mind because I don't know how, he came up with a system, a building captain system. And that's how the neighbors, the leaders of the building mm -hmm. were able to pull out the neighbors and say, we got to do this or we're going to wind up in the Bronx. Yeah, losing out. Mm -hmm. We're going to do this. And it, it really worked beautifully. They, they got people to sign on. They went door to door to door. And that was, that was the scariest part for me because as an organizer, I felt these people um, don't understand. They're gonna, they're gonna, they're gonna get displaced. They're gonna lose their homes. These buildings, we're gonna lose them to them, to the, to the, you know, the city's gonna just give them. I went to meetings where, where, we were told by the commissioner that we were not. Um, we're not. They said we're not organ. We're not. We're not managers. We just don't care. We just want this. Get rid of this problem already. We don't want to think about those buildings. We don't want to organize. We don't want to manage them. So make up your minds, or it was. Jasmine, don't you think that because all those years of working on it, that when you guys finally got to the tenants, who maybe were only there for the last five or ten years and didn't know about like sixty years ago, yeah. that you sort of had to bring them back Absolutely. in, sort of take them with you through the process that you've lived through yourself. Yes. So I think ultimately the history of, of everything that happened did help you oh, in, yes. in convincing Absolutely. people to buy in. That history and, I want to be yeah. able to. Yeah. You know? That's why I was screaming at them, come on, do this, sign this, because you're going to wind up in, in the Bronx After somewhere. All After all these years, come on. But this is not going to happen. I said, it's going to happen. With this close, we just need you to meet the percentage that, they, that APT wants. Please do this. And it's for you. I'm not getting nothing out of it. It's for you. Mm -hmm. I already have a 99 year lease. <laughs> you know? And that's why I'm here fighting. I want you to have the same thing. Yeah. But anyway, it was beautiful. Yeah, the, the sense of it and the sense um, from the ground level up um, um, over the years is of, uh, it's a fight. It's, it's, it's simply a long protracted fight. It's oftentimes internal. Mm -hmm. It's um, <laughs> constantly external. Um, it's a fight for survival. It's a fight to get to the next level. Um, it's a fight. And, and I agree very much with the sense that, that the more you can enjoy being around each other, the more energy you'll have to apply to right. the fight right. as a unified body. You gotta be a unified body. Together, that's right. We didn't, we didn't, we didn't always, uh, as I recall, um, present our best uh, sides. I, I, I can remember things I said in meetings that I regret <laughs> to, to this day. Um, I, I, I battled with Francis, um, and Francis didn't, at first, didn't trust me. I was seen as sort of an outsider. I was, you know, white from a middle class background, which had just moved to New York. I, you know, she had a long history of activism and politics on the Lower East Side, and uh, and we kind of, you know, were like this a lot. And but the more we battled and and talked to each other, the closer we got, and the more the trust was, you know, like deep, really deep. By the by, the end of all of this, I mean, I, I felt like. You know, we were family, um, and it, it, I'm emotional just thinking about it. And I, I also remember, I, I've got this document here, it's, it's like an unbelievable thing. In 1993, when we were pushing forward with the Mutual Housing Association, there were people within our community who were trying to stop it. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. And they um, were using the community board against us. We did not have support of the community board for a while. and. They, the community board actually set up a subcommittee which uh, was supposed to was supposed to be advocating for these tenants who didn't feel that the Mutual Housing Association was the right way to go. But what they really were was a, a kind of a, a, a rogue committee on a witch hunt to, to try to find some way to stop us. Mm -hmm. And I have this document where I had, I had, 
uh, was speaking at a meeting of the community board and um, um, the subcommittee uh, I write, which apparently interviewed no tenant supporters of the MHA and repeatedly rebuffed HPD's attempts at setting the facts straight regarding the tenant petitioning process. There were people who were petitioning the neutral, I mean the uh, community board that, you know, to stop this. They had said, thus the tenants in this case find themselves in the role of the poorly skilled single mother who finds herself sexually accosted by her employer. She believes she has little or no choice or ability to refuse the proposal. This came from the community board with regard to the role of the Cooper Square Drama. Committee. Drama. Drama. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of politics too. <laughs> That's drama. <laughs> that was a, a big part of it. Drama. You're right. Um, and I, I just ended the thing. Uh, uh, we are also reminded on several occasions by the chairman and others that the task force subcommittee was not an investigative body but was set up as the draft report states euphemistically for review, consideration, and communication of tenant complaints and allegations. From the beginning, however, the subcommittee has in fact carried on an investigation violating its own rules of conduct, and it has done so in a highly politicized and prejudicial manner. It is time for this witch hunt to stop. <laughs> <laughs> so, Drama. So, so this is the kind of stuff that was going on. <laughs> Yeah, that I've had my hand up for a while. I want to cycle back to something that Gina said, and I'm so glad he said it, um, because it, it's really relevant. And this group has been so great about getting things built, getting things done, ahead of the curve. And um, I guess this, in a way, is sort of a challenge, because when I was very in the process of being very active, one of the things I thought that was the most awesome is something that Chino mentioned, and that was the building, I believe it was 509 East 11th Street, where they put up a solar, uh, well, I don't know about solar, but they put up a windmill there. And they also had an event. The woman's name was Gibby Edwards, and I forget her husband's name. I've looked for them, you know, on Facebook and all this stuff. They moved, have since moved to D.C. But Tom Fox was part of that group who later founded the Water Taxi. And the idea was selling energy back to Con Ed. This is the 1970s. It was done. They did a battle. They, they won it. They were the first people to win the battle to sell their energy back to Con Ed. And what has happened to that here in, in the five boroughs of New York? It's finally getting started again, you know, and how many, 25, 30 years later, it may be too late. Um, this global warming and climate change is one of, a, is a huge, huge thing. And so is the fracked gas that may be coming in through your um, stove burners that uh, has possibly has radon in it. I live in Western Pennsylvania. Uh, that was my birthplace and I have family there. Um, it's a mess. And I would love to see the mutual housing do something about solarizing these buildings or figuring out a way to do a, you know, a transfer or to, you know, generate electricity. I mean, I think you could do it even though, and the high-rise buildings make them pay for it if they're blocking your sun <laughs> exposure. That's like, you know, it's something that I'm about ready to get involved in. Or there's the beginning of a real citywide thing on this. And I think it's definitely something for the... Yeah, you, you know, that building the, 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 is 519, 519. East 11th Street. Um, and I just finished talking to her husband, ex-husband the other day. Oh, okay. You know, we still keep in touch. But anyway, um, <clears throat> that was a project sponsored by Adapter Building. <laughs> And, and the thing is that, this, you know, when we first talked about the, it's a sweat equity building. The, the first sweat equity building, I think, in any urban area in New York, a few years later, then uh, Habitat for Humanity came and did a few of them with our advice based on the experience. But it was the first urban 11 apartments. 
But the funny thing about those days is that when the engineers and the people with the technology comes to us about it, I was very proud that we said, let's do it. Yes. <laughs> but, I mean, it never really worked too much, you know, but it did revolutionize, you know, urban energy in this country, you know, and now you do have in many cities a lot of solar energy. I hope that maybe Cooper Square would investigate how to do that in the building. The other thing is the panels that we used that time for the solar energy weigh like uh, 125 pounds each. Now one of those panels only weigh like 20 pounds. Mm -hmm. One human being could carry them. So the revolutionary thought that we, the revolution that we did is, is let's experiment. And we did. And they don't have it anymore in the building. They took everything down a few years ago because of insurance problems, you know? Because the equipment was too heavy for the roof and it was creating problems. But in reality, you know, it's the idea of trying now sweat equity construction, uh, trying now urban solar energy and urban um, wind power. You know, that created thousands of architects and engineers and urban planners came by to see that stuff. You know, people from Europe and Japan used to come in great, 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 great line buses <laughs> to see this thing, you know what I mean? Even though it wasn't working, they came to see it because, <laughs> be, because you know, uh, it, it, it was the beginning of something. It was the beginning of something, which, you know, so I'm very proud. I was the other day in Lake Tahoe, and I was with my daughter that used to live in that building. Once I separated from my wife, she used to live in that building when she was a little girl, and me and her, we went uh, with the kids to a park in Lake Tahoe area, and there were thousands of those windmills, those big <laughs> ones around, you know, and I told, I told my daughter, I don't know if you remember the Jacob generator that was in your roof. <laughs> the reason all these things exist is because of that little generator on your roof that, that, that we experimented with solar energy. You know, I mean, you know, seeing that all over the country as you travel is a revolution, mm -hmm. you know? And to be honest with you, when we first experimented with it, no place, no urban city wanted to experiment with that after we did it. And, and the thing worked, you know, and it did revolutionize certain laws with the deals between Con Edison, and, I mean, between the utility companies and individual people that produces uh, e energy, which has changed the law all over the country. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that, that agreement that 519 is 11th Street Day, the 11th Street Movement and Adapter Building, with Con Edison revolutionized the whole way how people could produce energy through wind power or solar energy in this country now, you know? I have a question I wanted to, um, it, I, it's interesting for me which way forward now. Um, I mean, you had mentioned solar panels. Um, I'm, I'm certainly a fan of, of rooftop gardens, um, but I was just wondering what people thought about what, what they would wish to come. Well, I'm speaking, I was just about to speak to something like that. I think it's very important that we, we do just what you're doing, Josh, um, and uh, spread the word so that this kind of thing can be replicated elsewhere. I think that's extremely important. At the same time, we face a I wouldn't exactly say it's danger because that's maybe too dramatic, but the danger is once we've got our apartments, which we now have, and they're great apartments, the danger is that we lose the sense of urgency that we had that made this thing work in the first place. And that period in the early 80s, when, there were, when Koch withdrew all the funding and everything had to be done by volunteers, 
even though that was a period of time when I was still keeping my head down because I thought I'd be kicked out of here if everybody knew uh, who I really was, um, that was a time that brought this community together really solidly and, and formed bonds that lasted through all the drama and through all the fights. And we had fights among each other. Uh, the big drama was a fight with the city, but there were fights among each other and people who didn't like what the various things that we were doing and so forth. It wasn't smooth sailing by any means. But we survived all of that because of the bonds that had been formed because we had to fight everybody. And that's the, well, it's, a, it's the great theory of, of, uh, of group uh, cohesion that as long as there's an outside enemy, the group coheres. Then when there's no longer an outside enemy, the group tends to splinter and begin to fight among itself. And then usually what happens in, in our Western imperial societies is that you project another enemy out there and create that as the reason to cohere. And then everything goes false. But um, the, it's, it's a continuing struggle. And a lot of the struggle now is precisely what you said, Howard, that uh, where do we go from here? How do we keep the sense of urgency and the sense of solidarity among each other and keep working on the next step and the, the, whatever the next thing is? And I know that one of the things we've done is try to spread out into the, into the Lower East Side and help other people who are trying to do the same thing we are, in fact, around the whole city trying to get publicity for this kind of thing, which of course is very difficult because they, the people who have the money and the power, don't want people to know about this kind of thing because if everybody in New York knew that you could fight and get your own building, own your own building, have a 99 year proprietary lease at about a quarter the rent that, land, that private landlords are charging, well, everybody would do it. Uh, and uh, the, the, the moneyed interests and the power interests don't want that to happen. Um, but how you keep fighting when the object of the fight is no longer securing your own home, but helping other people to secure their homes or to get another nice amenity like rooftop top gardens, which I'm totally in favor of, and solar panels, again, yes. But how do we keep going? Stop us for a second, just because we've come, we're coming close to what I was proposed as an end, and I just wanted to check in with everyone to see if everyone's willing maybe to stay a little bit past five. Yeah, we've got a good point of the conversation, but I think it's really yeah. important. We have a half an hour. Okay. Yeah. So um, I saw there's three people who are like itching to jump in. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, maybe we can go from this side over, or. Yeah. But actually, can we go. Me? You, and then. Yeah. And then Over me. here, and then to Lynn, and then Jasmine. Does that sound okay? Yeah. And um, yeah, I'm gonna. Lynn. I have I, questions, but this is going right. in, in great directions. And I, I wanted to remind everyone there are some sticky notes and pens around. And if you think of things while you aren't um, able to speak, you can write it down. And also, if you think of moments, you write it down, and we'll just throw them out there because they also can get up there in other ways than just being spoken by writing like a, a, a moment, which was really important. Just as you think, because it's probably these stories are probably generating memories, and it's awesome if you could write them down for us. Thanks. Okay, I, I just wanted to say that I hope that moving forward that, that Cooper Square continues to do what they did in the past, which is not only fight, but also keep an open mind and look uh, to other places for um, help and support. Um, and I just want to take you back uh, a little bit in time uh, when, when I was here uh, and it did uh, my work with Cooper Square Committee, it was actually um, the Dutch way of doing uh, mutual housing associations that sort of inspired us to suggest it for over here. Over there, you actually have a large uh, number of, of um, units of housing and in the city of Amsterdam, it's still more than 60% that are managed and owned by similar organizations um, and that's where the idea came from and there it's not only tied to the lowest lowest income people it is actually a very solid source of continuous permanent 
affordable housing, which allows the city of Amsterdam and other cities in the Netherlands to continue to be a very mixed-use communities, because uh, sort of from a from an urban geographer point of view, and I'm taking it back a little bit up from from the neighborhood uh, level, but but uh, I think it's essential moving forward that that strong communities are are mixed communities, and that part of maintaining uh, affordable housing and making it permanent is also. Uh, uh, to to make the city thrive because you know Lower East Side has changed. Other communities in, in in New York are changing. Bushwick is now becoming the next sort of gentrified area. So this process is not going to stop. It will continue to happen in the city and other places. So I'm happy to hear that uh, Cooper Square is looking to sort of export their, their knowledge and experience about how to set up a mutual housing association. But I just want to reiterate that way back when, the original sort of inspiration came from the Netherlands, and there are other places in the world. Same for more sustainable and energy efficient and, and uh, you know, uh, with, with good architecture and design in mind. So I just hope that, that um, uh, it's not just about picking a fight, but also maintaining an open mind and, and letting yourself be uh, inspired and, and, and helped uh, from, from other places. Yeah, so hearing what Chris is saying made me think a lot about what we do today. And we are still completely in the trenches fighting speculation. And the bad part about all of this is all that inspired uh, the original organizing to happen, um, all that bad speculation is alive and well and, and <laughs> just as strong, if not stronger, today, right now. Um, so the the buildings on uh, East East 4th and East 3rd, total victory, amazing. Um, and I think we, yeah, we're, it's something to be celebrated, something that I think as much as we can, we should have ambassadors out talking about this model. Um, Something else that keeps coming up in the conversations, and I know it's something that's alive and well in the culture of Cooper Square Committee, is organizing, the idea of organizing, community organizing, always being present, never having some top-down kind of um, dictate coming from anybody outside, but having the folks who are involved <coughs> in the community in these issues coming up with their solutions. Um, so as an organizer working for Cooper Square right now, I think that's another way that everybody that has a legacy in this could be involved and is involved at times, but could do even more to bring, you know, to the table for the community at large. Because <clears throat> in the work that I do in the Lower East Side now, it's almost hardly never on these two blocks because they are situated. Um, you know, there are other buildings that aren't part of the Mutual Housing Association that problems. My, my role at Cooper Square has always been to work with mostly rent-regulated tenants in the Lower East Side. And it's a really, really bad time for rent-regulated tenants in this neighborhood now who are yeah, the gentrification is run absolutely rampant. The laws aren't strong enough on their own to support their tendencies and to give them solid ground to stand on. Without organizing, when a speculative landlord buys their building, they are done for, like literally. Maybe a third of them will remain in their homes if they don't organize. The rest will be chased out through other means. It just happens. Um, so yeah, we're, we're fighting you know, all the same stuff in a different time, and the landscape has changed for sure. But um, yeah, I love that there has been this very concrete outcome to the organizing that was done years ago that has secured housing um, in a really fantastic way and one that needs to be absolutely systematized and, and put in place wherever possible, I think. But I think the other part of what's happened in the history of Cooper Square is just straight up amazing community organizing, sticking to the principles of never having, you know, um, anybody from the outside dictate what the solutions are, having people who are affected by these issues constantly at the table creating solutions, um, I think that's really, really important. And I think there's a place for anybody who's been involved from the beginning and helped creating the MHA to be involved in this this other track and the work we do today every day, too. So, uh, Before we go on from you, i just love if you could give a description of why this organizing started happening again. Because okay. it's a newer effort, but then also what the organizing looks like. Because you described to me like, yeah. the typology of what you're seeing. Sure. Very succinctly, the idea. So maybe if you could give us a brief, because uh, some people might know, but you know, okay. these people might know. <laughs> so I guess, yeah, I, I mean, the work that I do is, you know, starting at, from a tenant counselor, helping tenants to understand their rights, mostly rent regulated tenants to understand their rights, and helping them individually as they come in in nine to five, you know, uh, counsel, uh, counseling sessions was how things started, but then 
quickly as I started talking with Steve and we started talking about the history of the organization and I started talking about who I am and what I'm um, excited about and feel strongly about, we realized that there was more room to go back to the roots and continue to expand Cooper Square and continue the legacy of Cooper Square being an organizing organization. So I guess the, the, the most grassroots model to put in place when you use a community organizing in, in tenants' rights issues and gentrification issues is look at the tenants' associations individually, each building individually. Um, help them when their building is sold to a speculative landlord, fight that speculative landlord, keep their home, and then continue to be a part of the tenants' rights movement. So give them some agency in these issues, help them unpack the kind of social and political untangling, you know, the entanglements that are there that have allowed them to be in the sights of the speculation and be affected and potentially driven out of their homes and get them to be a part of uh, creating stronger tenants' rights. And, um, so the, basically a part of the larger tenants' rights movement that's happening in New York City. So we do that really well now on a, on a building by building basis and a counseling uh, level. We always do kind of social services with the social change. That's our model. If we have somebody in the office that needs help with, a, with any individual housing problem, we never let them out of the office without, without giving them some explanation of kind of what led them to being there and how you know, what things might have affected that are more complicated than they would originally think of when they came in for the initial problem. And if we can, we always take that counseling further to the building and say, you know, if you're experiencing this, your neighbors are probably experiencing this, let's do some door knocking, let's get some people together and see what we can find out here. Um, so we do that, we form the, the tenants associations, the TA, which is kind of our, our grassroots model. And then from there, we're always connecting tenants associations amongst speculative landlords. So there's probably like, a half dozen really, really bad acting speculative landlords who are buying a property down here hand over fist. And as soon as we know that one of these guys buys a building, we immediately try to connect the active tenant leaders from the tenants association that we help form to other tenant leaders in other buildings that these folks own and kind of try to create multi-building tenants associations and then go after them with court cases, with press, with everything we can do. Um, and um, in the process also helping the tenants and the tenant leaders connect to the larger tenants rights movement and kind of identify their issues on an issue-based level so they connect with campaigns that are issue-based and go up to Albany and fight for law, stronger rent laws and uh, do demonstrations on that level. So um, that's what we're doing today, every day. Um, and I think the organizing that was a part of creating the Mutual Housing Association is amazing and is very similar to what we're doing, um, except in a more a different, I think it was a different climate then, um, and you had the city just saying, you know, these buildings are have a derelict landlord. We're not, we don't want to own them, and it was an opportunity for organizing to look at something very finite and say, we, we're we're going to make this work where we broker ownership and collective ownership, and then eventually a co-op if possible. We see these opportunities here and there nowadays. If there's like during the predatory equity, um, the wave of predatory equity landlords that came through New York. We saw a lot of foreclosures that happened, and there was a couple of buildings in the Bronx that um, were through CASA, New Settlements work, able to go into the hands of a uh, really uh, good affordable housing uh, developer, Banana Kelly. This has happened here and there over the course of time, but um, you know nowadays it's just even keeping people in their homes is our, our biggest our biggest challenge, and then creating you know the, helping create stronger web of laws and helping the tenants be there at the table to to do that is what Cooper Square has been doing a lot of since I've been on board for the last seven years. <clears throat> so yeah, the, the, I think the, the housing movement has really kind of over the past 30 or so years really become about preservation. And, um, and then in this market where, you know, market-driven rents, rents have skyrocketed and, you know, regulated apartments, landlords are opting out of regula rent regulation like Project Big Section 8 and Mitchell Lama. So, we have now um, 53, more than 53,000 people in the shelter system. And folks, and it's estimated like hundreds of thousands of people doubled and tripled up with relatives. So when we're at Picture the Homeless, we're talking about housing, we're talking about we need new units of housing. So we need to preserve housing so more people don't become homeless. But if we don't figure out how to create new affordable units of housing, that's permanently affordable, then we're, we're never, this is never going to end. Yeah. So we have, at Picture the Homeless, always looked at Cooper Square as a model of preservation and creation of new units. And so um, 
back about a year and a half ago, we catalyzed this uh, alliance, the New York City Community Land Initiative, that really built on several years of meetings with progressive planners and grassroots organizations, um, with Tom Engadi and Peter Marcuse, Picture the Homeless, several other groups of Cooper Square was at some of those. And um, so we're looking at a policy, like citywide policy perspective, um, the city of New York, now we have a new mayor, we have a new speaker, but people don't just wake up one day and say, oh, community land trusts, you know, you have to teach them about it. So we've done, and Cooper Square has been involved, we did a briefing for the city council speaker's office and the legislative and policy um, department. And I'm on the board of the CLT now, Cooper Square CLT and MHA, and um, we endorsed as a board to get more involved with the New York City Community Land Initiative. Um, we are organizing a community land trust in East Harlem. Yes. East Harlem um, has a lot of failing HDFCs, HDFCs that have already failed, till buildings that are kind of stuck in this pipeline that now looks like it's to nowhere. Um, we have a lot of vacant lots and vacant buildings also. And even though they're not owned by the city like they used to be, it's still messed up that there's all these vacant buildings and lots. We did a count uh, a couple years ago and, and found enough vacant buildings and lots to house nearly 200,000 people in 20 community boards and published this report. So Jasmine and Valerio came to our second residence launch meeting that we had in East Harlem. We are moving forward um, the New York City Community and Land Initiative with incorporating a community land trust in East Harlem. It would be different than Cooper Square because we're looking at scattered sites, um, and, but it doesn't mean we can't do it. You can right. figure it out. Um, and then we are organizing shareholders and tenants in city-owned buildings to, so that they could determine, does it make sense to organize into one entity or entities and what would that look like? and then legally, how can we make it happen? And uh, we have support from Josh with his other hat on uh, from the new school. Uh, there's about 80 some buildings that um, we've already targeted for door knocking and met with folks. Uh, we still have foreclosure issues in East Harlem and then we have things like the third party transfer program and the asset sales program that the city really use, has been using these programs under Giuliani and Bloomberg to transfer struggling buildings into the hands of private for-profit developers that then can just sit on them and do nothing. Dangerous. Or use them uh, for speculatory purposes. So there's a tremendous amount of opportunity still, um, and there's a tremendous amount, there's damage that's been done, but even in this neighborhood, there's opportunities. And so I think that Cooper Square has a really leading role to play in saying there, here's an example of something that has worked. And, um, and so I'm really happy that the, the, the Cooper Square CLT board um, is going to get more involved with the so citywide initiative. I just wanted to jump in there and say that, you know, when we started the MHA, that the, um, we came up with this idea that there would be two entities. There would be the MHA and there would be the CLT. And the reason that we did that was that the feeling was that if we just had an MHA, um, that there would, uh, we might lose control of it after a while because mm -hmm. the tenant's interests might be to sell. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's just a normal human thing, right? Um, if you see this opportunity, the board, you know, the board of the, the MHA might, you know, at some point vote to um, allow, you know, for people to make a profit on their apartments, um, which, you know, could benefit the, those individuals, but then it stops right there. That's the thing. It, it, it's a one-time thing. So, so what we did, we came up with this idea that there would be a separate board, which would, uh, a separate group um, uh, that would essentially uh, have title to the property and that they would put a stop to any, and their mandate was to maintain that uh, property. And therefore the, the, the MHA itself could never go out on its own 
separate from the land trust. Oh, that's what's good about it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I wanted to make a comment uh, about a comment that you made, Renee, uh, that you say you, you played a small role. No. Well, I was there for the birthing of the MHA, working on when you, you came, your group came from Amsterdam. I was fascinated by, you did, you guys, you guys, you, Brian, you, Renee, Osha, and, yeah. and Yvonne, you guys brought this here. You brought this to us, this structure that we needed. And that's a major role. Don't ever say it was a small role. <laughs> I'm so, we were so lucky. We were so lucky. We were very lucky. Yeah. Thank Found you. Lucky. Thank you, Jasmine. Okay. Don't ever say it's this small. No. All right. I would ever say that. Please don't. Just point of information. That was brilliant. Uh, in this document, at some point, you know, when we said that uh, one time Cooper Square had to lay off everybody, et cetera, et cetera, that was um, not because Cooper Square did something where they were irresponsible and mm -hmm. they did bad management, et cetera, et cetera. That wasn't the case. Like other agencies, that's what happened to them. That was a planned action by the conservatives in this community and the cash administration to cut the funding off Cooper Square somehow, thinking they would destroy it. And thank God it didn't work. But at the end, Cooper Square went to court and they won the case, okay, against the Catch administration. And they got refunded. So it's important historically that we all pass that word around. Cooper Square didn't do anything wrong. The only thing that they, they, they did is good, good stuff, meaning giving cash a hard time and giving the conservatives in this community a hard time. And that temporary layoff was an organized matter by the conservatives in this organization. I don't want to mention names right now. And the, uh, and, and the uh, mayor in the city of New York. The details of the city, I don't know. So it's important to know that because, uh, you know, that was a planned action against Cooper Square, mm -hmm. and he failed. And, and just very quickly, I think it's really important, really important for other groups that are starting in on this kind of a path to know that it is not the money that makes the thing work. It's the people. It's the organized community, and you can take all the money away, and if you have an organized community, you can still work. Yeah. And that's the, I think that's a very important thing to mention in a historical document, what he just said and the fact what, how Cooper Square survived those months or year, I think it went for a year, the people were unemployed. I don't remember the details. Valerio would know because he was the director at that time of uh, the committee downstairs. I want to ask a question on that though about the people. And I'm in planning school, the community planning school sort of. And there's a lot of talk about models and people are chasing and chasing models. Mm -hmm. Right? And um, but when you look at the process it seems pretty obvious that it's dependent on relationships and also the models that you set up produce particular types of relationships or make certain types of relationships possible or not possible. And I was wondering if, with this sort of like amazing base of experience and knowledge, if we could have a reflection on, um, and this might be a challenging question, I'm not sure, but the model that has been created here now, um, what does it set up that other contexts might not have? And, and I'm curious if that's a fair question. Like this, like community controlled housing, the, the land trust, like this sort of, it's like a complex, system, ecology that has been set up. What does it make possible? What does it not? It, it, does it help create the, the relationship? Or is it possible because of the pre-existing relationship? I'm curious about this. It feels like when we talk in planning about these models, it's way you do. 
it's, it's really hard to understand it, what is being produced and what it's, it's dependent on. Okay, but a, a quick answer to that. One, the, 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 the organized, the, the, the organization uh, is possibly replicable uh, for other communities and so forth. What's not replicable is the community itself upon which this organization uh, is based or grafted. I mean, other communities can, can create an MHA and, and a CLT and so forth and maybe make them work similar to how ours does. But what every community is going to have to build it on the basis of their own unique character and personality. And this block is a village, and it always has been. When I, I, when I moved here, I spoke okay Spanish. I'm totally bilingual now, partly because I live on a block where <laughs> so many Dominicans and Puerto Ricans live, and, um, and there's, a, there's a wonderful Puerto Rican word called bochinche, and it is uh, rumor mongering. And that has been, I mean, that happens. Everybody knows everybody's business on this block. I mean, it, seriously, to my embarrassment, a couple of times, people know everything I'm up to. And, <laughs> and, um, but it also means that there is a system, not, I can't even call it a system, really, a method of communication that just exists. Nobody set it up, nobody designed it, <laughs> it's just there. And you can use that, we use that, to our advantage whenever we can, but it's going to be different in other communities. So you have to start with the unique character of your own community and base the organizational stuff on that, even though you might be able to replicate, you know, MHAs and CLTs and so forth. But every community is going to be different. I gotta say, though, no need to reinvent the wheel. At some point, you, there are lessons to be learned, and there is Absolutely. stuff that we can take. And, and and I totally agree with the uniqueness, and you have to make it work in that particular community. So coming in and just saying, "Here's the model, go do it," that's not going to work. But there are uh, certain elements of of the legal and the organizational structure. Sure. You really don't have to reinvent the wheel over and over. And if it's if it's if it Proof that it worked in the New York City context, in the context of neighborhoods that are under pressure, uh, then, then I, I, I think there's no, no reason why you wouldn't try it uh, somewhere else. I, I, I think that by a lot. Thank you so much. Nice to see you. Bye. Bye. Um, in, 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 in bringing uh, this model somewhere else. I would imagine as, as it goes further out uh, and different neighborhoods are doing it, doing the, the project, it's got, it, 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 will, it, it will just improve, improve. The clinches that are there now with our new MHA mm -hmm. is, we're, we're reaping them out, we're weeding them, we're get, finding them out so that you will make the same mistakes. So that you will have more solidity in in your in your structure. People, I mean, there's over 200 community land trusts in the U.S. now, and um, and some are in urban areas. There's a San Francisco one. There's an LA one. Um, what, in East Harlem the other night, people were asking, "How did you guys do that?" And it's not because people in East Harlem don't have their own, you know, culture and uh, history and aspirations, <coughs> but there's mechanics to it that people want to know because they don't know about it. And just like, you know, when you came from the Netherlands and people heard, oh, they're doing this like this here, they're doing this like that there, it's not oppressive if you're learning things and then you're applying it to your community. It's only oppressive if somebody says you have to do this and don't ask any questions. Um, and, but because in New York we, you know, we all deal with the city, we deal with HPD, it was very, very um, instructive that Cooper Square folks could say the city owned our buildings and gave us our buildings. Um, it's very important when we go to HPD then we say that. There's a precedent for this. There are city programs that were more progressive than the city programs we have now. 
There used to be the DAMP MHA program. Mm -hmm. There used to be sweat equity. Yeah. There used to be all kinds of progressive programs that were phased out. And so not only learning from Cooper Square, but also learning from the housing movement in the past and how mm -hmm. housing was created. I think we it behooves you all of us in yeah. New York to understand those things you, you now. Can't, you can't wait for the city to Come up, come exactly. up no. You wait to forever. Door. I don't mean, I don't mean No, but I don't mean any, and I mean this anywhere, not just New York City. Yeah. Um, you know, there are there are people who work in city government who are good people and have good ideas, but the, the politics, you know, it's very complicated. And, and even now, when we have a you know supposedly progress, more progressive mayor, it's not going to change things drastically. It's still going to take individual. Right efforts in communities to come up with their own ideas, engage the city. The city, I mean, you know, they aren't all like, you know, they aren't all ogres in, in HPD. They can be dealt with and, and communicated with. And we, we were successful at that eventually. Once we got over that sort of demonizing them, mm -hmm. it, was, it was tough during the Koch years because there was stuff going on there right. that, but later, even under Giuliani, there were several deputy commissioners that, you know, we, we spent, we had the same kind of meetings with them that we would have within our own group. We, we, we had moments where the deputy commissioner was like walking out on us and saying, we're not going to deal with you anymore. <laughs> but then the next week we were back meeting again. You know? <laughs> right. And we got, once you start to work with people and engage them, they get a stake in it. And so you want this, the city to, to, be, to get a stake in what you're doing, um, not just keep them at arm's length, and that was something we were successful at doing. It was very difficult, but we did. Someone wasn't able to be here, but I spoke to him on the phone two Sundays ago, which is Stodden Lynn, who was one of the founders of Fran in 59. Um, and he's since, since become a historian, worked with Howard Zinn. And he lives in Ohio, and he's still kicking, he's writing books, um, and uh, still doing act activist work with his wife. but. He was very specific to say that when they were first imagining the plan, that there needed to be a plan, and that they were going to start the committee, he, I guess, had got, just gone to Columbia and wasn't afraid of going down to City Hall. This is his, what he had said. And he went down to City Hall to find planners. And he ran into, he found Walter and another gentleman whose name I can't remember at the moment, and invited him to that first meeting. And they came. And when I heard that story, him telling that, like that first, to start even at the beginning of the Cooper Square, that's evidence that people in the city can be allies. Because look at what the impact Walter Thabit has had on the history. There was, there was one deputy commissioner in particular, a guy named Joe Schuldiner, who um, opened the door for us to do the, the Q building that was a mm -hmm. homeless fa family housing project that's, that's, the that's still part of the MHA. It's part of the MHA now, right? No. Uh, it's not. It's a separate entity. It's a separate entity. It's a separate call. Okay. Um, we, this, if you can believe it, in like 1980, the city was, you know, wanted to sell the building for a dollar yeah. because, you know, at that time, nobody wanted these buildings, right? right? Um, so, but they wanted to sell it for mar to become market rate housing, and we were going to lose this battle, and we came up with this idea that we would uh, renovate the building and we would do it with sweat equity and stuff that we were just like coming out of our rear ends with, you know, we were coming up with ideas that we had no idea what we were talking about, but we were able to, we needed, we, there was a, a state program for funding uh, for homeless housing that we felt we could get, but we needed what was called site control, and the only way we could get site control was if a, if a commissioner would say, yes, you have the right to apply for this money for a period of time, and Joe Schuldiner said, I'll give you site control two weeks. Mm -hmm. And in those two weeks, we nailed that state money. And once that state money was in our pocket, they couldn't stop it. Because mm -hmm. they, couldn't, they couldn't turn down that million dollars the state was willing to give us. Mm -hmm. And so we won that thing. And some year, a year, two years later, when we finished the project and we had the dedication, mm -hmm. Joe Schuldiner came to the, uh, to the dedication, and I took talked to him on the side and I said, you know, this thing ended up costing like 10 times more than we proposed and, you know, I, <laughs> and he said, he says, 
you don't have to worry about that, he said. You got this thing done. That's the only thing that counts at this point. <laughs> anyway, I, I'm going to... Uh, believe me, I'm on five minutes. Yeah. Yeah. I wanted to just ask if... I think we should come to an end now. Yeah. Yeah. We actually came full circle, maybe, to the present and, to the, mm. and all, even talking about the future, which I think is positive for this experience. Um, and then we've had sort of some even brainstorm we didn't imagine in the bed. Um, but I was hoping we could take a photo together. Because okay. right now we've just had video, but why not get a photo while we're here? Yeah. Sure. Sure. And, uh, Not too late to have a car. Do we have any kind no, of never. anniversary we could do?